Okay, today's assignment is The Izu Dancer, Izu no Doriko, by Kawabata Yasunari, uh, published in 1927 when Kawabata was uh, 28 years old. <clears throat> At the beginning of the study guide, I have a short description of Kawabata Yasunari, his life, his works. You can read that. Um, for now, I'll just say that he is one of the most important uh, novelists of the 20th century. He's the first Japanese writer to win the Nobel Prize. Um, and we'll probably read uh, two or three of his works in the course of this semester. Okay, this, this is his debut work, um, and I will skip the, inf the background information and jump right into the study questions. There are 17 questions in all this time, and I will walk through the questions, walk you through the questions right now. Okay. Describe the narrator, his social position, his personality, his motivations, etc. Why does he consider himself a misanthrope? How does his experience on the Izu Island, the Izu Peninsula, rather, cure him of his misanthropy? And uh, you will want to keep in mind that um, you'll probably read at some point Yukiguni, the snow country, right? And I like to think of the protagonist of that story, Shimamura, as sort of, of a, an older uh, version of the protagonist and the narrator in this story, okay? And you see the same structure in a lot of uh, Kawabata's works, right? You see a male protagonist or narrator who's kind of sick of the city life, sick of modernity, sick of its pressures and constraints, and he wants to seek a more authentic uh, mode of living, and he leaves the city and goes into some sort of country side area or rural area which represents a sort of... Um, pre-modern or non-modern world, right? And we see that here, right? The protagonist is leaving the city life. He's sick of life as an elite student at the top university in Japan. Uh, and he considers himself a misanthrope. Why does he consider himself a misanthrope? How does his experience cure him of his misanthropy? Okay, that's number one. Number two, describe the setting. Make a list of all the place names that appear, appear in this work, right? So as always, um, when reading works of Japanese literature, you want to be very uh, aware of the place names and the area. And the, if, there's, if it involves travel, you want to keep track of the uh, towns or cities that he walks, that the protagonists or the characters walk through. And in this case, he leaves Tokyo to go to Izu. So there's a lot of place names from the Izu peninsula area. You want to uh, make a list of those as they appear and look them up on Wikipedia or on, online, whatever. Number three. Number three, um, what is the certain hope that the narrator harbors in the opening scene? What does he seem to be plotting? Right. So he mentions a certain hope that he has upon seeing the girl. What is he referring to here? Number four, Describe the dancing girl, Kaoru. How does she seem to hover between the two realms of childhood innocence and young womanhood? And I think in all she has several dozen uh, statements or remarks or uh, conversations that she has with the characters. And I think each can be placed in uh, one of the two categories, right? As, in the, as belonging to the realm of childhood innocence or young womanhood, right? So she kind of fluctuates between these two realms. Explain how she fluctuates. Is she more in the world of the young girl or is she uh, more in the world of uh, young womanhood? Explain that. Number five, make a list of the minor characters who appear in the work. How are they related? How, does the, how do the older women behave toward Kaoru? How do they behave toward the narrator? That's sort of a simple plot question. Number six. Kawabata was very involved with a new perceptionist group uh, in Japanese, Shinkan Kakuha, when he wrote this work, right? And in the uh, introduction above, I mentioned the magazine, the literary journal Bungei Jidai, that he was affiliated with in the 1920s, which is sort of a modernist uh, literary magazine that he was... Um, involved with, and this was sort of the center of the Shinkan Kakuha 
literary group, right? And um, what modernist techniques can you find in this work? So obviously in order to answer this question you will need to look up a little bit about the Shinkan Kakuha group, see what their um, sort of uh, characteristics were. And I should note also that um, after the war, after uh, Kawabata won the Nobel Prize for Literature, he was often described by Western journalists and Western writers as a, um, or Western academics as a very traditional, a traditionalist basically, who uh, inherited the Japanese tradition and kind of um, employed that and revived that in his works. And they tended to ignore this sort of modernistic aspect of his writings, right? So in the 1920s, Kabat is writing very experimental, very avant-garde, very um, modernistic works that um, are often overlooked. So my point here is uh, you should not read this story or any other Kabata work as sort of a traditionalist narrative, right? Read it and be very aware of the modernist techniques that he's using and describe those in your answer to this question. Number seven, another simple plot question. Why does the narrator sit rigid in his room on the night of the party? Right, so Kaoru is entertaining guests at a party in the, uh, in the adjacent room. What does he fear might happen to the dancing girl, to Kaoru, while entertaining the male guests? Okay, very simple, straightforward question. Number eight, discuss the outdoor bath scene in which the narrator sees the dancing girl naked. Why does he suddenly, why does he feel that suddenly a draft of fresh water seemed to wash over my heart? Why does he feel as though a layer of dust had been cleared from his head, from my head, he says. All right, so he explained that scene and his reaction to seeing her naked bathing in the uh, water. Number nine, I should note too that one of my Zemi seminar students last year for her um, uh, Sotsurong, for her graduation thesis, wrote a very interesting paper about the use of the use and the function and the meaning and the significance of uh, the water motif in this story. So water appears in many instances in different uh, contexts and uh, signifying different things and she gave a very close analysis of all of the water images and water motifs that appear in this story. A very, very good paper. Number nine. Does the plot of the Izu dancer correspond to the Freytag Pyramid? Right, and I think I handed out a uh, worksheet on the Freytag Pyramid that explains what it is, so you can uh, look, review that in order to answer this question. Explain. Number ten. It has been 49 days since the prematurely born baby died. What is the significance of 49 days in Buddhist funerals? Okay, so this is just kind of a footnote question, right? So if you read the original Japanese, there's usually a footnote on this passage that explains what this 49, the significance of the 49 days is in Buddhist funeral customs. Number 11. Discuss the class distinctions that appear in the work. Alright, so you want to keep in mind that this is written at a time of rising class tension in Japan and around the world, really. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and you see um, the rise of the proletarian movement and the possibility of class warfare ever present all the time, right? So that's in the background to this story. So you got to be very careful whenever you read a novel from the 1920s to uh, pay attention to this um, class dynamics as they appear in the work. Um, so yes, discuss the class distinctions that appear in the work. How are the entertainers viewed by the local residents, the inn managers, the other characters? How does the narrator's attitude toward the entertainers differ from these other characters, right? So the narrator, um, who has kind of an artist's sensibility, I think you could say, reacts to these uh, entertainers in a different way than the regular um, sort of middle class or lower middle class folk that 
are around them. Okay, number 12 uh, is kind of a continuation of the first question, or one of the, was it the first? What is the second hope that the narrator harbors? Right, so in the beginning he he harbors a certain hope, and we confirm what that was in an earlier question. Now he has a second hope that he harbors as he reads to Kaoru from her storyteller's collection. What is his hope in this context? All right, simple, straightforward. Question number 13. Describe the structural or stylistic similarities between this work and Matsuo Basho's Oku no Hosomichi and diary literature in general, Nikki Bungaku. Okay, so a second ago, a minute ago, I mentioned that um, Kawabata is not exclusively a traditionalist uh, writer, right? He's very influenced by the avant-garde European modernisms that are taking place in the 1910s, 1920s, and he's writing in that mode. But he's also, of course, at the same time, drawing from the Japanese tradition, specifically the works of uh, Matsuo Basho, I think you could say, in this work, right? Oku no Hosomichi, the idea of Nikki Bungaku, the genre of Nikki Bungaku in general. So in order to answer this, look into these, um, into Matsuo Basho's famous uh, work and this general genre. Okay, number 14. What images of death appear in the work? Describe their significance. Right? So, <clears throat> I think I mentioned on one of the other study guide commentary videos that um, it's always good to make a list of all the binaries that appear in the work, right? And, and then explore or examine how they are related. Right? And you can do that in this work too. And two of the binaries are sort of life and death, right? This, and water, I think, is associated with life in general, right? purification, water, life. And then uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have death and the various images and motifs surrounding death. death. Okay, so this, this question refers to the death motifs and death images that appear in the work. Describe their significance and their function in the text. Right, number 15 is describe the purification or the ablution scene at the spring of the well. And I don't think the word ablution or misogi in Japanese is a Shinto term actually. I don't think the term is specifically used, but it seems like a, um, it has sort of resonances or echoes of the Shinto ritual of purification or ablution. So describe this scene and um, describe it in the context of Shinto ablution rituals if possible. Number 16, describe the last scene. Describe the last scene. Why is the narrator crying again? Why does he eat the boy's lunch as though it were mine? Right. So on the return, on the um, his return home, he encounters a young boy who's of the same class, basically the same age, and I think who is studying to get into the same university that he's in. Um, and he sees the boy, and they sort of immediately bond. Right. Why is he crying again in this scene? The narrator. Why does the narrator eat the boy's lunch as though it were mine? Why does his head feel clear and empty? What does he mean by a beautiful emptiness? Right? Is this scene related to the ideas of Bambutsu Ichinyo, the unity of all beings or all things, in Zen Buddhism? Right? So I think the first generation of scholars that were writing about Kawabata would often talk about his works in the context of Zen Buddhism. And there might be some traces of that here. Right, in this final scene. So you want to consider uh, this s ending, right? And you might want to also consider this ending in relation to the final scene of Yuki Guni, too, which kind of ends on a similar note of the narrator being kind of swept up or uh, sucked up into the Milky Way, I think, in that novel. And here he experiences a kind of similar uh, Buddhist um, awakening or sort of sudden unification of uh, self and other, of himself and the out, outward universe, right? Is this scene related to the ideas in Zen Buddhism? Okay, and the final two paragraphs are, The boy opened his lunch, and I ate it as though it were mine. Afterwards, I covered my face, I covered myself with part of his cape. I floated in a beautiful emptiness. Right, an emptiness, as I mentioned in other videos, a key Buddhist term, of course. And it seemed natural that I should take advantage of his kindness. Everything sank into an unfolding harmony. 
the lights went out, the smell of the sea and of the fish in the hold grew stronger. In the darkness, warmed by the boy beside me, I gave myself up to my tears. It was as though my head had turned to clear water. It was falling pleasantly away, drop by drop. Soon nothing would remain. <clears throat> and the final question is a simple speculation question. Um, before parting with Calder, I think they, he, he vows to come again in the summer and stay with the family once again, the entertainers once again. And the question is simply, do you think that the narrator will ever see Kaudu and the entertainers again? State your reasons. Alright. So there are a lot of questions here. Some are more important than others, so if you find um, yourself writing longer answers to some rather than others, that's fine. Um, answer these questions to the best of your ability and as specifically and concretely as possible. Okay, that's all. If you have any questions, send me an email. Bye-bye.